goodbye. For a cancer patient, that word has two very different meanings. That's why when we've done everything we can, we do things nobody's done before. At the Christ Hospital Health Network, we collaborate with Dana-Farber Brigham Cancer Center to offer next level care, developed by the world's best minds, treatment that could change your odds, or maybe the world. The Christ Hospital Health Network, everything it takes. The Pound This Podcast is brought to you by the Christ Hospital Health Network. This is the Pound This Podcast, episode 787, Pound This Live, lies we tell ourselves with Lindsay Bonadonna. I want to lose weight, but I don't know how to get started. What should I meal prep every week? How do I get those sweet booty gains? Inspiration for your healthy lifestyle. The Pound This Podcast with Amanda Valentine. What up, friends? I am so excited to share this episode, which was recorded live at the Pound This Party in early August, which was my 40th birthday party. It was a live podcast event. It was a health and wellness event. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much to everybody that came. But to everybody who couldn't make it, I wanted to make sure you could hear some of these conversations. And this one was great and not part of this recording. But before we got started, Lindsay led the entire room. We kind of did like a little bit of a guided meditation, some breathing, kind of felt our own bodies. It was awesome. And this whole conversation was amazing. And, and something I thought was really cool about these live events is being able to take a live Q&A and walk around with the microphone and take people's questions. So hopefully more of these live events in the future. Uh, you'll have to give me your feedback and let me know if you enjoy listening to the these live podcasts. Um, but it was such an amazing day. And um, it's exciting to kind of relive that again through listening to this. So not only was Lindsay a guest on the podcast, but Sarah from Team Fit With Me was also an amazing guest. If you missed last week's episode, that was from the Pound This Party. And of course, if you're looking for an amazing health coach who is very passionate, who has been on a, a, a long journey of her own in health and wellness, then you can definitely hire Sarah to be your virtual health coach. You can go to teamfitwithme.com slash pound this. There you'll get 10% off month one of all packages and plans, whether you're dealing with hormones hormonal issues or gut issues, whether you want to lose weight, you want to gain strength, she can help you do all those things because (laughs) nutrition and everything is hard to navigate, which is also why I'm very excited to be working with Clean Eats uh, here in Cincinnati at Newport is where I've been picking up my food. I've been a meal prepper forever. That's been personally great for me on my own journey. And now I'm incorporating that into my life. So I'm doing 21 meals a week from Clean Eats in Newport, which if you're in Cincinnati, you can also go to Clean Eats in Westchester if you're more northern Cincinnati. But the food is freaking delicious. I mean, it's it's better than I make. I've had people ask me for years, like, can you just cook for me? I'm like, I don't think you want me to cook for you. <laughs> it's fine for me, but... Yeah, let Clean Eats cook for you. So if you're looking for something that's more convenient, fits into your life, there's so many different options. The fresh menu changes every single week. And it's been just, for me, it's been so nice to take Sundays off from cooking, from meal prepping, and don't just know that I can mix it up during the week. Because again, if you're one of those people, I can't eat the same thing every day. Then this is a solution for you because you can mix it up, especially with their frozen selection, and eat something completely different all day every day of the week, which is fabulous. So if you're looking for some easy nutrition that's made for you, check out Clean Eats in Newport or Westchester here in Cincinnati. Or if you're not in Cincinnati, look and see if there is a Clean Eats near you. Now, let's get into this amazing mindset reset with Lindsay. Thank you so much for listening to the Pound This Podcast. I'm Amanda Valentine, and this is Lindsay Bonadonna. And we're going to talk about all the ways that we lie to ourselves. And I think that you and I have many discussions between ourselves, even including like me preparing this event and yes. stressing and being like, I suck and I can't do this and I can figure this out. And then you're like, no, you got this. Take a step back. And it's like every aspect, whether it's we're trying to accomplish something or it's how we feel about our body or it's how we feel about our friendships or relationships in our life. It's like we build this story up in our brain that's untrue. And I think that you're just really great at kind of pointing a spotlight on that and being like, no, it's not that way. Let's look at it this way. Yes. So where this all came from, I want to share that the last six months have been, I've been in this place where I have been, am I becoming and reflecting or am I severely depressed and withdrawing? Has anybody been there before? Maybe you're there today. (laughs) 
And I just kept on thinking, and, and it was very unlike me because what you're seeing is how I normally am, right? So I started playing around with like, well, if, if I'm not this, will people still like me? Will I be accepted? Will people know how to handle me if I say that I'm okay or I'm not okay instead of like, yeah, I'm great. Y'all, I even changed the emoji that I was using. Like it went from the bright smiley face to just the like, I'm okay. <laughs> but anyways, I was in this, this whole time while I was going through this, um, and I had some crazy health stuff happen, I continued to find ways to take care of myself. I continued to do yoga, I continued to walk in the morning, I continued to meditate, and I'm really grateful I did that. Because I came to this Qigong class that I've never taken before at the studio I teach at, and it's a really cool experience. And all of a sudden, this thought came into my head very clearly, and it was, the lies that you're telling yourself are catching up to you. And I was like, what the F? So after class was over, I sat with that for a little bit, and I'm like, what does, what does this even mean? And as I thought about it, I was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's that I'm not a good mom. It's that I'm not a successful health coach. It's that I am a horrible person. It's that nobody likes me. It's that nobody's gonna accept me if I'm sad. It's that I should be getting better quicker. It's I shouldn't be feeling this way because I'm a health coach. I do all the things, why am I sick? And as I sat with that, I started to think about, but like, what's the actual truth? Like if I look at the facts of the situation, which I did, none of this is true. And I started getting really curious and thinking more. I love neurobiology and how our brains work and how brilliant and dumb they are at the same time. And the pieces that really struck me was that these lies that we tell ourselves that we very strongly believe at times really show up in all areas of our life. Y'all, when we're lying to ourselves, that creates a whole cascade of hormone situations that we don't even realize are going on. And it's serious shit, especially when we start to look at, we have a lot of external stress, but the stress that is being cultivated inside of our bodies and the disease that comes from it is, is insane. And it all starts from us not believing the truth about ourselves, which is that we're awesome, like truly. Like, Every human in here is awesome. We have things that we don't love that we did, maybe we would do differently, we're still awesome. I think what else is really interesting too, Amanda, is that like, and this is where I was saying how our brains are brilliant and like really dumb at the same time. So from a bodily physiological perspective, our brain doesn't understand the difference between if someone is screaming at us if we're being chased by like a t-rex or like our life is actually like we are in a legit life or death situation or if we're telling ourselves some lie and starting to spiral down it is all the same inside our body and when you think about it that way it's kind of crazy because you wouldn't think that we would have the same reaction the intensity is a little bit different but the same hormonal reaction physiological reaction to me saying to myself lindsay you fucking suck and <laughs> you gotta leave now <gasps> <laughs> lindsay you swear too much it's some soap in that mouth <laughs> there's not a difference between me convincing myself and getting into this headspace of that i don't deserve a seat up here versus I'm about to get killed by a Tyrannosaurus Rex that just like happened into the room, right? Like that's kind of wild to think about. What are your thoughts on that? I just wanted to check in really quick before I continue on with my... <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree with that. And I think that's what's awful is because that we do that all day. And I think that even like little things of like you see an email pop up of like, do I respond to this right away or a text or whatever, mm. and even that, or if you, then you're like, I'm a bad person because I'm not responding right away or I am setting boundaries and I'm doing this. Like there's a million different little decisions around literally everything all yeah. day that we never get to exit that like we're just you know firing on all cortisol cylinders yes. and you're just burnt out all the time because it's 
talk, like just how you interact with the world, how you think about yourself and all aspects of, of who you are, where you're taking somebody, somebody said this is inflection and tone, whether it was in a text or in person, and it must be about me, and why do they hate me? And it's like you just live in it, and you yeah. just spin in it forever. And it's like, is there even a way out of that? Because it doesn't feel like there is, other than just being aware of it and catching it in the moment and then just trying to work through it from there. Like that's why I just really love Brene Brown so much where she talks about so much shame and vulnerability and of like, mm -hmm. can you catch it and then just release it and let it go? And I feel like that's just the best you can do because I don't think it's ever going to go away, but how can you just manage it better so you're just not fried all the time? Yes, and I want to ask everyone, encouraging everybody to be vulnerable, but who here has gotten really great at lying to themselves. Like who here believes that they suck or should have done something different and spends more than like one minute marinating on it a day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? It's like, or I love what you said too, Amanda, of like somebody sends an email, which we cannot tell tone over people unless somebody's writing in all caps. But I write in all caps because I'm excited. I'm not yelling. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this. But we take something like that that we don't even know is true and then we turn it into this whole narrative to reinforce this really crappy narrative that we've written about ourselves. It's really interesting to me too in my practice with clients. Um, I think it's really funny. Uh, some of the things that I love to celebrate with my clients is that I had a client the other day tell me that she ordered her own donut instead of eating the crumbs from her daughter's donut. Y'all, I celebrated that like it was like the next coming. I was like, <laughs> hell yes. And then it was really cute. I have another client that told me that she needs help being less productive. And I'm like, yes, let's do that. But anyways, sorry. Um, <laughs> I've noticed with my clients is that, and, and myself too, is that we get really crafty about how we reinforce these narratives with ourselves. Like we find crazy things to reinforce these lies. Here's what we know. Thoughts are things and emotions are things. They are not who we are. They are things that occur. It is no different than coming to this event, right? This is a thing that you're coming to or you're picking up your coffee. That is a thing that you are drinking. A thought is something that you experience. An emotion is something that you experience. It does not define who you are and it does not have to, but we can get really wrapped up in letting these thoughts and emotions define who we are and using them as a way to reinforce whatever we want to believe is true that day. Something else that really struck me too is I feel like this was maybe in untamed, something Glennon Doyle or Brene Brown, but it really struck me when she said that we can choose that a truth is no longer true for us. What? How does that like, I don't know, let's like do this, like a thumbs up, thumbs down, like middle thumbs gladiator thing, but like when I say that to you, how does that feel? That if there's something that you've known to be true about you up until this day, that today you can decide it's no longer true for you. Like, how does that feel? It feels kind of weird too, right? Because truths are true. That's how it is, they're absolute. They're not, we get to decide what's true and what's not true. But that's scary, it's also badass AF because it pushes against this narrative that we have to be a certain way in order to be accepted and worthy. Well, and I think like uh, in, for me and, and my own journey and probably and for so many people in this room have gone through a level of transformation or looking to transform it and really critically thinking of who am I, who do I want to be, and what changes do I need to do to match that? Yeah. And so, you know, I told myself for a long time, like, I'm not a person that likes exercise. I don't do that. That's not who I am. And that was my narrative for a very long time of like, that's not, or just even like the hiking and outdoor stuff that I like, like forever, it was not like, that's not who I, like, it'd be cool to be that person, but that's not who I am. And then it was just sitting and reflecting of like, well, that is who I want to be. Like I, maybe I do like these things and why can't I define that as me and making those choices, which is hard because you're shifting things in your life, but it's like, 
you know, you only have, like, every day is a brand new day. Like, we just got here today. It's a time to, like, be who you are right now. Who you were yesterday doesn't have to be who you are today. Mm -hmm. So you can just be like, well, maybe I am a person that likes to hike. And maybe I am a person that likes to go to the gym. And maybe I am a person that meditates. And then be like, well, let me try it, because maybe everybody I went to high school with doesn't know me as that person, but I doubt they're that concerned with me anyway, unless they want me to be a girl boss on their team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they want me to be part of their, be part of their sales crew. But it's like, you're just like, you, I think you get stuck also not in your own head, but who everyone around you thinks that you are. Yeah. Like they think that I'm this person and I'm afraid to break out of this because everybody will be like, well, who does she think she is? She's not that person. Yeah. But it's like, but you have the control to change that if you want. It's just not the easiest process. Yeah, it's totally not the easiest process. You made me think of too, um, if you all have ever been into a situation that is maybe new to you, I think about, I had an experience um, at the gym and with a personal trainer that I'm working with. So he started having me do deadlifts and I walk into it the first time and I'm like, oh, I don't think I can do this. I've never done this before. It's going to be really hard. And he's like, okay, how do you know that? And I'm like, fair, I don't know that. <laughs> but that's what I'm thinking. But it started to get me to catch how many times, because I'm a yoga person, right? So like weightlifting isn't really necessarily my jam. But I started catching myself going into these different exercises. And my first thought is, oh, this is going to be hard. So I stopped saying that because y'all, if you go into a situation and you're like, this is gonna be hard, this is gonna suck, guess what? It's gonna be hard and it's gonna suck. If you go into that situation with maybe just curiosity, like, shit, I don't know how this is gonna go. I don't know, let's, let's just see what happens here. Well, and I, I gotta jump off of that too yeah. because that's so true, specifically with the case of like weight loss, of like, I can't mm. do this. I've done this a million times before. I mm -hmm. suck at this. I yo-yo. Like, I'm not any good at this. And like, well, yeah, you're going to continue to not reach that goal because you've already started with the intention that you're not any good at it and that you're going to fail. Yeah. Like, you've already told yourself, I'm setting myself up for failure. So you are. You're making that come true based on what you're telling yourself. Yes. And it's, it's really interesting. Are there situations that you all walk in, or maybe it was even walking in the door today where you're like, oh, I don't know anybody, and is this going to be weird, and I feel nervous. Does anybody go into situations just kind of thinking worst case scenario first? Yeah. So with that too, I just kind of want to acknowledge that from a, a neurobiological standpoint, this isn't a willpower situation. And as it comes to to dieting, weight loss, lifestyle change, and everything. I know sometimes we can get caught up in this narrative of like, I don't have enough willpower. I failed. I ate the donuts. <laughs> Everything's ruined forever. Um, it's not a willpower situation. We really need to take a look at what's happening physiologically in our bodies. We're all of a certain age, right? We're all, we're all like... I'm turning 21 tomorrow. I know. <laughs> I don't know, 40 is pretty awesome. I feel pretty hype about it. <laughs> but, um, you know, we've lived a life where we've learned different ways to survive. And some of these ways are very helpful and beneficial and holistic and wonderful. And other ways, and there's many of them, that don't necessarily serve us anymore. And we may be at a point in time now where we're like, man, I don't know if this is what I've been doing is working. But we have to understand these ways of being, these ways of surviving, these ways of making sure that we stay alive another day are ingrained in our brain as these habits. So we have to acknowledge that if our first thought going into a situation is what is the worst case scenario, or I'm not good at this, or I suck, or whatever, that is a survival technique that has come up in your life enough times for your brain to understand that it's useful and it will keep on going there first. Also, fun fact, we're not wired as a species to be happy all the time. Please let that soak in for a moment because I kind of knew that in theory, but when I heard somebody that's like a neurobiologist tell me, I was like, wait, tell me more. We're not wired to be happy all the time as a species. 
because if we were wired to be happy all the time, y'all, the human species would not survive because when we're happy, we are not aware and our primal brain needs to make sure that we stay alive and that we procreate and we continue on and all that stuff. So the fact that we're not wired to be happy all the time is because we need that other piece to be able to survive and continue on. With that being said, it's really confusing when we live in a society and a culture that says if you're not happy, something's wrong with you. You need to be fixed. You need to take this medicine. You need to do this therapy. And that causes, I really think it perpetuates this whole like lies we tell ourselves because maybe we feel cool, like we are fit and fancy. I'm like, yeah, I'm confident, I'm feeling this vibe. But then we have this society pushing against us saying that health is a number. It has to be a certain weight, a certain way that you look. You have to be happy all the time. Don't burden other people with your difficult feelings. That's what I grew up with, so yay. <laughs> um, but we have all the societal narrative that we have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge the neurobiology of how our habit and our behavior patterns are formed, and we have to understand that there's a lot that we can do to modify and grow and change them, but it's not like our fault, if that makes sense. This isn't, if something isn't going or we're not doing something the way that we want it to go, instead of making up lies to reinforce this pathway that no longer works for us, it's time to start challenging it and being like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't think, I actually don't think that's true. I actually do not think that's true, but it takes time and it takes repetition and it takes some, um, we're all ladies in here, so I guess it like takes some like ovaries, some boobs, <laughs> some like takes some estrogen, right? It takes some beautiful female magic to recognize that we are worthy just the way that we are today in this moment, absolutely perfect. And we need to start acknowledging that to push against this narrative that keeps on telling us that we're not enough unless we do X, Y, Z. Like, well, F that. And to, and to jump on that, I think it's also to learn to be okay um, to be labeled as a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to be like, that's, I, I don't need to people please. I think that I, that's a huge thing for me. Mm. I'm like, you just got to make sure everybody else is happy. And if I'm not feeling happy, and I'm so guilty of this, I'm like, I'm going to keep mainlining more caffeine to try to keep me up here. <laughs> So nobody thinks of like, oh, she's in a mood or she's like this or you have this label slapped on you. I'm like, well, so what if I do? Like, you know what I mean? Like, why can't, why am I not allowed to be, express those feelings and have boundaries around that? It's just, yeah. I think there's so much fear of just kind of like letting that go and, and being where you are in that moment. And if I think, I feel like as I'm learning through this process of like, once you kind of feel it and you're there, it goes away much faster totally. than trying to like keep it up to a 10 like let it ride at like a four for a minute and then it comes right it comes back up so much faster and you feel better once you kind of just sit in those feelings without worrying how other people are going to perceive them yeah and that's like let's be real that's a hard hey people pleasers anyone out there <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i am um, 100% like that was i look at my health journey started about three-ish years ago, but I look at my time before that, and I'm like, wow, I'm not quite sure how I survived. I'm not quite sure how I got through some of these different things that happened in my life with this mindset that I can't be myself, that I have to try to make everyone else happy. Ooh, another favorite thing that I like to do, every once in a while I still slip back here, is uh, managing other people's disappointment. Like I remember literally having this thought of like, I can bear this disappointment, but I don't want anyone else around me to be disappointed. Like mm. what, what? <laughs> but my point in sharing this is that, you know, cause I, I've been to different conferences and speakers and stuff and you hear the people on stage and they're like, yeah, you just do this and it's fine and look at me and all of that. I think, I, I don't want to speak for you, but both Amanda and I are still, our, your journey never ends, right? You're always learning stuff. You're always going back to these kind of old ways of being. They almost like seduce you in a way. But what's powerful, I like to think that the aspiration of our life journey is not to get to this perfect place where we're 
eating for our bodies all the time and like, like my company is kale and cake because I think that you can have both, like real honest to goodness cake and sugar and alcohol and you could also have salads and all that kind of stuff, like it's all a big part of the picture. But I think the aspiration is more often than not, we feel at peace. More often than not, we're making choices that are in alignment with our own purpose that we've identified. More often than not, we don't give a flying F about what other people think about us. Because fun fact, nobody cares about you as much as you think they care about you. Oh, and also, nobody's staring at you as much as you think that they're staring at you. So wear the effing outfit that you want to wear. Stop questioning it. Put that shit on and rock it out. Because literally, nobody cares. I don't know. I've been staring at you for like a half hour now. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> right <on. laughs> but, but I think, I think that's the aspiration though. It's not this like black or white or like I'm all in or I'm all out. I'm on the wagon or I'm off the wagon. It's just like, yeah, each day you want to know what? Man, I noticed that in comparison to six months ago, I feel more like myself than I did. Well, I if, feel more sure. And yeah. I think that if you're not screwing up and you're not failing, then you're not growing. Like you're not, yeah. you're not changing. You're just staying in the same exact place if you're not screwing up. Yeah. Like you're not moving forward in any sort of way if every day is the exact same. Yeah. And I mean, that's fine if that's where you want to be. Like that's totally cool. Everybody's on their own journey. But it's like if you're like, hey, I'm trying to be present and live my life the way I want to live it, you're going you're gonna to mess up and you're going to Get, people are going to be disappointed and people are going to be angry and someone's going to think you're a bitch and you're just going to have to learn from it. <laughs> yeah, and more than likely, the person that thinks that you're a bitch isn't going to be in your life or be a meaningful person in your life long term. So it really doesn't... Like, why would you sacrifice what you feel is right in your body for somebody that came along maybe one time? Because, my gosh, those one-timers that just come along and drop that bitch bomb on you or their opinion of whatever you're doing they think sucks, like that can really jar you. Um, you made me think of a, a useful tool as we explore and we'll kind of like go through the handout and everything as well. Another useful tool that I found is that, you know, oftentimes when we're going to make change, especially as it comes to mental change, we really have to explore some places of like, what is the fear behind our concern of changing? So, um, I think about it like when I was getting ready to launch my business. So I worked for 13 years in the beer industry and I loved it. Um, I decided to separate from my now ex-husband because that was not a good situation. Very hard decision, but not a good situation, my friends. Um, but I worked at his, at his brewery, right? So I was out of a job and I had to start making some decisions. I was involved in like a health and wellness uh, network marketing company, which I never in a million years thought I would do. Um, so I was like, I don't want it to be a creepy pyramid scheme. But I ended up <laughs> doing pretty good with it. But through that, I was like, holy crap. I'm very passionate about helping and supporting people. And then I found out about health coaching and like on and on. So I decided to launch my own business. And going into that, oh, all kinds of lies all kinds of stuff that I'm not good at, finances that I'm not good at, coaching that I'm not like, things that I literally have no facts for, right? But I started to pause <clears throat> and I asked myself, what am I actually worried about that I'm not gonna be successful? Okay, well, why are you worried that you're not gonna be successful? Well, because if I'm not successful, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna impact the world, I'm not gonna make money, I'm not gonna be able to support my family, all right keep on going. So I kept on going down, down, down this rabbit hole. So the fear that I came across was that, well, I didn't think that this was going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my deepest fear is that my daughters and I, I have a nine and a five-year-old, Presley and Lucci, and they're really awesome. My fear was that we were going to be homeless that it would mess things up so badly that we would be homeless and I wouldn't even have enough money to get McDonald's and they were dirty and we haven't showered and it's cold and like all of that, right? And I let myself really sit in there, the reality of that for about five to 10 minutes. 
And as I sat with that, my logical brain started to take back over instead of, you know, this primal fight or flight brain that literally has no logical thought. So as I started to shift back into the logical part of my mind, I was like, well, shit, I, would, I wouldn't let that happen. If for some reason my business didn't work out or I decided this wasn't my jam anymore, I would go work at three McDonald's before I let it get to that point. And then all of a sudden the fear was gone because I'm like, well, that's completely in my control. I can always get another job. I can always go back to the beer business, whatever, all of that, it will be okay. And then all of a sudden I just kept on moving forward. And there are days where it's still scary, but I just keep on catching myself and being like, you know, Lindsay, like, that's actually not true. You're actually, based off of the facts, you're actually good at what you do, and everything will be okay. And oh, yes, businesses are not built overnight. Does not happen in six months, friends. No. Fun fact, right? Like, <laughs> that's also a lifetime journey. But... <clears throat> I think it's really valuable when you find yourself getting worried about something or making that change or working on something, a, a mental pattern, or maybe going to seek therapy or a coach or some type of other modality. If you're feeling worried about it, see if you could get to the bottom of what is actually the concern there. Because oftentimes it, it might be something similar to mine or it's just a fear that, well, what if this doesn't work? I've tried everything. What if this doesn't work out either? Well, if it doesn't work out, then you know it doesn't work and you can move on to the next thing. Okay, all right, we can do that. There are very few decisions in our lives that we can make that would have catastrophic outcomes that would end the world or result in somebody dying or something like that or us dying ourselves. Very few decisions that we can make. We're just not, while we are powerful, yes. We are not that powerful. So I really want to encourage you as you explore these lies that you're telling yourself to really try to get to the bottom of them and see what's chilling out there. See what is underneath all of that. It is scary. It is hard. There are tears. There is all of this kind of stuff. But trust yourself. Trust yourself to know when you're going to need support. Trust yourself that you're strong enough to ask for support. Trust yourself that you've done the work to surround yourself with people that will notice like, hey, I think you need some help, but I'm here for you. You're not walking alone. And just see what happens because even the scariest decision, it was scary to decide to leave my husband. I've been married twice, y'all. Fun question. Is your first thought, oh man, she seems like she's pretty put together, but she must be crazy. What's going on? <laughs> which could be our societal narrative, but truthfully, I essentially married the same person twice because I never took the time to sit with myself, get to know myself, and as cliche as it is, really love myself and appreciate myself. So I always looked for that externally, and that doesn't work out well, but yeah. So I know you put a <clears throat> handout in everybody's folder. Can we kind of go over some of the bullet points in that real quick? Yeah. So this is the uh, how to discover your truth in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so as I had this realization in that Qigong class of like the lies that I'm telling myself are catching up, and I thought about, well, what do I want to do about this? Almost every day, not every day necessarily, but during my meditation, I think about, or just in the morning when I'm getting ready, I'm like, all right, what lie do I want to, or I'm sorry, what truth do I want to discover about myself today? And then I think about a lie that I'm telling myself. So, you know, a great one is that I'm not doing enough as a mom. So after you identify that lie that you want to shut down, you define the opposite of it, which is the truth, is actually, I am a mom that does enough. And then take some time to think about, like you need to be in a place to really think about the truths of the situation, like the actual facts, the tangible actions, and start to go through these in your head. So for me, if I take a look at it, so if my truth is that I am a mom that does enough, but that feels uncomfortable because, you know, 
that yucky thought comes in. No, it's never enough. But if I look, I'm like, all right, well, um, I do these activities with my girls. They like to spend time with me. I like to experiment setting boundaries with them, like when I need to take a nap or rest. <laughs> and they respect that. I like to play Legos with them. We like to do things, like we like to go places. So as I look at all these things that I do, I'm like, oh shit, yeah girl, you do. You probably do too much, that's actually the truth. But it's really powerful also from a, a brain standpoint, if we find ourselves spiraling into a lie or a false belief that we have, that's where that deep inhale comes in because that helps, those, that deep breathing actually helps to calm our nervous system and let our body know that we're not actually going to die, that we are safe. So as we do that, we start to pull ourselves out of this illogical part of our brain into our logical brain. And that's when we can start to look at these facts. And as we look at the facts of the situation, and maybe you start to find yourself finding facts of like, well, if you're, let's say that your lie is that, uh, that you suck, that nobody's going to show up. <laughs> if we look at the truth of it, it's like, oh wait, but, but there are ticket sales and people are engaging and people are supporting and all of that kind of stuff. We very quickly continue to be in this logical mindset and that lie starts to dissipate very quickly. So we're kind of attacking it from multiple angles, from like a biological standpoint and acknowledgement, but also just from kind of like a mental, like kind of like, yeah, mindset standpoint as well. Once you discover and kind of go through this list of things that reinforce your truth, like the actual truth, not this bullshit lie that you're telling yourself, it's really important to let it soak in, like to just sit with that sit with that feeling. I wanted to lean back to show you how to sit with feelings like this. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. Um, for those <laughs> listening on the podcast, I sat back and put my, I like groomed the beard that I don't have. I sat with it. But anyways, it's really important to let, take a moment to let this truth soak in. We breeze through and rush through really important shit a lot in our society. We need to slow down, let it soak in, and notice how your body feels with that truth. Like, notice where you feel it. It also can be very, pow very powerful to notice where you feel the lies in your body. I always feel them in my chest, in my jaw. Notice where the truth feels, how that feels in your body. If you feel relaxed, if your heart feels light, maybe you just feel, there's not a word for it, you just feel at peace. And after you let that soak in for a minute, and there's no right time, there's no like prescription of like, spend five minutes thinking about your truth, spend two minutes letting it soak in. Like just trust your body, just, list, just be with yourself and let that lead. The last very important step is that you have to self-celebrate that shit. Self-celebration looks like acknowledging that you just did something really rad for yourself. Some people like to do a little dance or pat themselves on the back. You can go like, woo woo, out loud, or internally, you can just be like, yeah, Lindsay. Fuck yeah, good job, you just like undid that lie. You know your truth now, good for you. When we take this time to self-celebrate, it helps to rewire that pathway much quicker than if we just rush through it. This self-celebration also works really well when you're trying to form any new habit around your health, your wellness, and your life, anything like that. Like legit, y'all, I was trying to like get my water intake up. Every time I took a sip of water, I was self-celebrating that shit. I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being so Hydration, <laughs> I did it. But now I drink like a ton of water a day. So don't ever underestimate this what can feel very cheesy, but this amazing technique that we all have, it costs nothing and we can do it quietly in our mind or we can do it big time of just self-celebrating. And then I want to know, I know where's Jay with the microphone, does anybody yeah. have any questions? Because we can do some like questions if anybody has one, if you want to raise your hand, if anybody want to ask any questions or add anything. This is so fun because normally like my podcast is just us sitting in a room or on Zoom and I'm like, oh, there's other people that can join in if they want to. So I just wanted to give everybody the opportunity if anybody had any questions. 
No? Going once, going twice. Yes. Oh, we have one up here. Hold on. Jay's coming with his microphone. So what are your thoughts on social media? Like, I am oh. constantly told I need to get off social media because I feed into that too much. Ooh. Annette, that's an awesome question. <laughs> I actually just took a two and a half month break off of social media because I got to this point where I was like, I can't do this. And then I like told a whole bunch of lies like, but nobody will know I exist. And what if people need to reach me? As if I'm like this, like, I am important. I'm not downgrading that, but it's like, nobody really gives a shit, right? Like, yes, my stuff is nice, it's inspirational, but nobody's gonna die but over it. But not only from you posting though, but like, <laughs> but like absorbing what everybody else is doing. So what was really interesting in that is that from a subconscious level, and there's lots of research about this too, what we see on social media absolutely impacts us in ways that we don't, we're not necessarily aware of when we're scrolling, but it plays out in our day-to-day -day life how we feel about ourselves, especially, you know, at, social media has been around for such a long time, so we weren't necessarily as mindful in who we were friending or following in the beginning. It was just like, yes, all the people, let's do it. When I decided to come back to social media, there was something surprising that happened to me, though. So I started curating my feed. Like, I just unfollowed. I thought about deleting my entire account and then was advised that wasn't a great idea from, like, a business standpoint. But I was like, but I just want to torch it to the ground and start over. <laughs> so instead, I started unfollowing people. <clears throat> and what I realized when I came back on with kind of this more curated feed is that it felt really good to see these inspirational quotes. And I forgot, you know, as I was kind of like figuring out, am I severely depressed and withdrawing or if I'm becoming and reflecting, I realized that social media was a way for me to connect with people and to be inspired that I didn't really recognize it was a source of that for me. So I think, Annette, if you were to kind of sit with yourself and maybe we can all like kind of go through this exercise together do you guys well, want to like kind know. of what go is it first yeah <laughs> i don't know well, wait I'm let me finish my thought i realized first. i just i know <laughs> <laughs> i realized i just like skipped over but annette i i'd love to encourage you to like take some time today or when you get home or tomorrow whenever you feel like you want to do it and just kind of sit with yourself close your eyes and see what you're feeling about it and what decision that you want to make. And maybe it looks like taking a little break. Maybe it looks like just getting off of it completely. But I definitely think there's value. If you're questioning it, you know the answer of what to explore. Well, and I think also it's just become this, like, oh, I have a free second. I'm going to mindlessly hop on here. I think with stuff like that, what, make a list of other things that you enjoy. So it's like when you went to mm. go right for your phone, of like, I'm going to scroll, of like, well, no, like maybe I could go for a five minute walk or whatever, or whatever that is for you, of like, what else is there that can fill that place? So when you immediately kind of go right there, maybe it's not social media, maybe it's like a game or just something else. So like, is there, is there an audio book or write a journal entry or whatever that is it for you that you kind of have like this go to things to divert yourself? from that because it's, it's such a hard thing to break. And just from, for me too, talking about social media, because I know a lot of you follow me on Instagram here, and I used to do my meal prep Sunday so much more, and I, I don't do it as much now because it was just wrecking my mental health. Like it was, it, it was something that was for me, and I, I love meal prepping, and I had fun with the process, and I just wanted to show that and have fun with it until it wasn't fun anymore. Then it was like, I'm doing a show. I'm performing. Here's this thing for me that now has to have all this thought in here. Am I being funny? Am I creating enough recipes? Will anybody care? Like, is this engaging? And it just became like Sunday would show up and I would like literally cry. I would cry and then wait till I have my composure and then be like, it's meal prep Sunday. And then be like, that's not real. <laughs> that is not authentic to me at all. And I'm like, so I would, I had to sit there with my own you know, in my own ways with, with social media and be like, you see other people, well, they're doing it and they're crushing it and they're putting videos up every day and they look so happy and it looks like it's easy for them. How come this is so hard for me? How come I'm in my head about it? And be like, no, but for, for me, like, it's like, this is something that is so important to me in my life that I'm like, 
I'm sorry, everybody else. Like, I know this is helpful, but some weeks I have to just do this for me because I can't let this destroy me and I don't want to be this fake person that is just troving through it and posting a happy picture when I'm not feeling happy right now, which brings us right back to the beginning of this conversation. Of like just being in that moment and being authentic to yourself and not worry about disappointing everybody else or comparison yourself. So if you're like, I feel like, well, all my friends keep in touch on Facebook and this is where I need to be. Be like, they'll be fine without you. Maybe they could pick up the phone and we can pretend it's like the 90s. And so it's, it's one of those things, if it's going to protect your mental health, that's number one. And you're just going to have to figure it out from there. Yeah. I think, too, um, with social media, I mean, it's, it's funny to me because this is the impact that it has on our brain from an addiction standpoint is not much different than cocaine, right? And I kind of crack up. My kids have tablets and things like that. Like, don't get me wrong. And I can definitely have my time scrolling. Um, but I think what's funny is that, like, if we saw kids at a restaurant, like, doing cocaine, we would all be like, what is going on? But, like, we see kids, like spaced out on their on their um their tablets and stuff like that and we're spaced out on our tablets or I think about you know times at dinner where where we're all on our phone and everything like that and it's just like huh this feels weird but social media gives us this quick dopamine hit and to what Amanda was saying it can be very powerful if we're feeling like we want to grab for our phones to notice to just take a moment to pause and be like why do I want my phone right now? Am I avoiding something that I should be thinking about? Yes, I am. I'm going to put it back down. Let me think about what truth I want to discover about myself today. Or let me go for a walk. But it's hard because we're addicted, you know? Well, and I think it's so hard to just be present because with the kid doing cocaine thing, a scenario, like if you were like a Cracker Barrel and this kid's just doing lines on the right? table, be everybody would be like this instead of actually doing something. Instead of like stepping in, everybody be like, I'm going to go viral on TikTok for this kid doing rails and Cracker Barrel. And so it's like, we're not actually present and we're not actually looking out for each other because like we get so absorbed in it. And I think it's just one of the things you stand by of like, actually, am I present in this moment? Because then I think my actions would be differently rather than if I'm like looking at this moment through the, the lens of my phone. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's a place, sorry, Annette, I feel like we're like, do 50 million things, but we, I we think, answered this question so hard. Yes. <laughs> does, any, does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Oh, I we think, have one over here. Oh, yeah. I think just pausing, though, Annette, before you pick up your phone and scrolling and just seeing what pops up for you. Although I'm a total TikTok addict, so. Oh, my God, it's so That's good. why I took it off my phone. <laughs> I so I'm hearing a lot about pausing from the external and turning within. And I'm curious to hear your perspective on once we turn within, then calibrating back out and and building the support system, right? Because it's Mm. critically important for me to know me and be with me and build that trust. And I'm, I'm not alone. I get to also calibrate that I have circles, I have people. And so can you just speak into that recalibration of me and we and and um, rebuilding in a healthy, beautiful way. Wow. Thank you, Krista. I was reading Atlas of the Heart, um, Brene Brown's new book, and in there she talks about how we only have the capacity to love others as much as we have the capacity to love ourselves. And... I believe that in spending more time with ourself, and spending time with ourself doesn't mean that you need to isolate yourself and contemplate 24-7 or anything like that, but in taking time to just be with yourself, to learn about yourself, to learn about your preferences, to really get to know, I mean, I'm, I'm 41, and I'm just really getting to know myself at this age, you know? I don't know if anybody else feels that way, right? And I think we always get to learn more about ourselves, but... I think the more time that we take to just be and know deeply what we need, our heart's desires, our dreams, and to let ourselves feel those things, we start to notice what is out of alignment in our life. And this could be friends, this could be people, like 
as you learn how your body feels in different situations, you just start to notice, like you're around somebody and you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if this person is right for me anymore. And that could be a partner, which is really hard. I like to call this like a midlife awareness instead of a crisis. It's only a crisis if you ignore it. Or a it. midlife calm, maybe. Krista has a book called Midlife Calm, by the way. Yes, I saw, <laughs> yes. We're on the same page with this. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we start to acknowledge these differences. We start to notice them more of like, I like to talk about like when you, when you grow, when you're curious and everybody that's in here is on this path. So this is probably already happening in some areas of your life that you may or may not be acknowledging yet. But we start to vibrate at a higher level and we attract what we put out there, right? So as we're vibrating at a higher level, we're attracting these kick-ass people like that's that's how I know Amanda. That's how I know a few different people in this room and getting to meet people, right? And then you start to notice this gap between the people that are not vibrating at the same level. And that's not to say that they're bad people or anything like that. They're just at a different part of their journey. But it starts to get to a point where you just realize that I don't really want to spend my precious time around people that are tearing me down or don't make me feel great about myself. Like straight up friends, and I'm just gonna be like direct with this. If there's people in your life that make you feel less than, know that you're worth more than that and know that it's okay to kind of transition them out of your life. And it doesn't have to be a dramatic thing. But you deserve to have people in your life that celebrate everything that you do that are able to question you and challenge you in a way that encourages growth and does not stop growth. And I think that integration comes, and Crystal, let me know if I've answered your question in a way that makes sense. I think it's kind of like a, a both and situation, right? We need to take time to know ourselves and know that that's okay. We don't have to rush through that. We are our number one priority, y'all. Last I checked, we're the only ones we spend our entire lives with. Everybody else comes and goes, even people that we love, right? We are the only one we're with our entire life, yet we are the ones that we put last. So we have to know ourselves. And then with that, we also have to have that network around us that loves us and accepts us and encourages us to be messy. And that when we show up and say, I'm not okay today, that they're like, that's cool. I'm still here. Super important, yeah. Super to have both. That well, absolutely answers. Thank you. I also wanted to add to that, too. I think that when you think of that, you think of relationships and stuff like that. I think that also absolutely applies to jobs. Hell yes. <laughs> that also think of that, too. If you're going into a place every day that's tearing you down or that you feel like, oh, my God, and you're counting every second to get out of there, it's scary to leave a job. It's scary to do those things. But I think that's it bleeds into all aspects of life because I think uh, like everybody I'm talking to today is just like, screw this and quit their job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that, that kind of goes, again, like those decisions are hard, but it's like, do I belong here? Is this where I want to be? Is this helping me or is this hurting me? So. Yes, yeah. And I love, oh, just really quick, because I would love to, if more people have questions. Um, <laughs> you make me think about, so I love to work within the primary and secondary foods. And primary foods, there's 13 of them, and they're things like career, relationships, spirituality, movement, home cooking, home environment, joy, education, etc., belonging, etc. And then secondary foods are what we actually ingest and digest. And what's important is that we acknowledge both of these because if we're just focused on what we're eating and how much we're moving and we're ignoring the potential shit show that's going on in the primary foods, we're never going to be able to make that sustainable change with how we're nourishing our bodies and how we're getting to know ourselves. And if we're not nourishing our bodies in the way that feels most authentic to us, and we're not knowing ourselves, we're not going to have the energy to make change that feels really scary, like changing your career or leaving a relationship or changing a friendship or going out and going back to school because you're super hella passionate about something. And maybe it doesn't make sense on paper, but who the fuck cares? It makes sense to you, and that's all that matters. Do we have any more questions? Oh, we got one over here, Jay. So 
when you have like a lot of different things you're interested in or many things that you want to do at the same time, how do you make those everyday little choices? Like, do I read this book or do I watch this show? Do I practice my violin? Do I study this language or do I do this or X? Ooh. Because they zap your energy and it just takes a lot of energy just trying to decide what do I, how do I spend my evenings when I get home from work? Oh, totally. I am also a multi-passionate person. So yes. Um, what I, and what's your name? Brianna. Brianna. What I like to do, Brianna, is I take that deep breath. I, pr I take a few of them, because there are definitely times where a lie I like to tell myself is that there's not enough time in the day to do everything that I want to do. So I have to do everything right now, because what if I don't? So I like to take a couple deep breaths going into whatever my free time is, and just kind of close my eyes. And again, this isn't like a five minute thing. This is like a however long you need to breathe deeply to get yourself back to center. And I just kind of like to feel like, what is going to be the most nourishing to me right now? And as you practice this, it will become clear very quickly. It's like your body almost leans in as the thought comes to your mind. And let that lead and do that one thing. And then see what wants to go next. But I think moving from a place of feeling like, oh my gosh, I want to do all these things, which is awesome. Kind of discerning, making sure that you're not feeling like you need to do all of those things, but just kind of coming back to that deep breath, getting to know what you want to do that night and also know it's okay to, to not do anything. How does, that, how does that feel? Does that feel helpful? Tell me a little bit more real world. Um, just a little bit because it's like I need to, because like with like violin or languages, it's something you have to do consistently in order to keep those skills up. It's not just reading a book or tonight I don't want to read the book or that you can do every little bit. It's something that there is a, consistency is key. Yeah. In building those skills. So let me, let's connect after this because I want to talk to you directly more about it. I have some ideas for you because um, there are things too also like, in addition to taking the deep breath, there's techniques like actually scheduling the time and making it a non-negotiable that this gets canceled, like this is something that you do and building it in as a regular routine or habit and doing it in a way that starts really, really small or fun size as I call it. But yeah, let's, let's connect after this. I would love to talk more about cool. it. And I wanted to hop in on that for a second too because like for me, I'm building a new habit where I want to meditate every day because it actually does give me like the chill space. It's just for like 10 minutes, like nothing crazy. But I find myself like... I'm in a TikTok scroll. I'm like, oh, I don't feel like doing that, even though I've made that a priority for myself. So I think it's hard too because you feel the pull to the other things. And like where you're saying, like you take a breath and you come in, I'm like, okay, well, I have all these like 15 million things I want to do, but I'm being pulled in this different way where I think where you stop me, like, okay, but what is more important? Is it practicing your violin or is it doing whatever thing is or is it scrolling? And I think it's like those are hard decisions because I think that you'll naturally get pulled in other ways without having to actually really like, especially with the consistency part. Like it's like you can go nice and strong and you got three weeks down and it's awesome and then all of a sudden you start floating away from it again and then it's like, okay, well is this important? I need to stop, is this a priority? And then kind of pull yourself back because I think that even though you're building a new habit and you think you got it, there's always a, something happens or you know, there's an emergency or you go on vacation or whatever and something stops the consistency and there is mm -hmm. a break and then it's up to you to determine like that priority list and where you're at to kind of get back on it again. Otherwise, everything is just kind of float around everywhere. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's and hard. approaching just with like kind of curiosity and, and trusting yourself. Like it will really all, it will really all be okay. There are many times where it like legit does not feel okay. Like everything is burning down around you and it feels impossible and scary and you're not even sure how you're going to get out of bed, but you did open your eyes. Know yourself, surround yourself with people that love you, challenge these lies that you tell yourself and just at the end of the day, know, like take a deep breath and know it will be okay. Well, if somebody in this room or listening to this podcast is like, yeah, I do, just like you guys are going to have a conversation after this, and I want to know more, how can they reach you? Where do they find you? Yes. Yeah, so on Instagram, I am Lindsay Loves Wellness, and then my website is lindsaybonadonna.com. Yay, fun name, Lindsay with an E. And 
I, I do want to say this too, because sometimes when we're feeling very isolated, we can be like, oh, well, I don't want to reach out to somebody on Instagram or whatever. Yeah, reach out. Please do. Like, send a message if you're in a really hard headspace and just need that reminder that everything will be okay or you need access to, to services or support or anything like that. Just know that we are, we're all in this together. But, yeah, I would, I would love to chat with everyone. All right, everybody give it up for Lindsay Bonadonna. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. AmandaValentineBites.com